Morning, everybody. I mean, well, it's morning for me. It's 10 a.m. in Silicon Valley. Um, so, yes, so I decided that um, the whole topic of the intersection and interaction between the pandemic and our crusade needs a bit more structure, a bit more coherence. I've been saying a few things about that for quite some time, really, you know, since the um, since the pandemic began. Uh, but the things that I've been saying have been quite fragmented. And uh, I think that's also true for everybody. Um, various people on the chat are saying they can't see the video. But there's nothing to see. So that's okay, except for my glorious beard. So I don't suppose that matters very much. Um, Right, so yes, um, so I thought what I'd do is, especially since we are, as I mentioned a moment ago to Chris, since we are um, doing this in parallel with a couple of other Zoom rooms on other topics, um, you know, I thought I would um, not try to give kind of a, you know, a, a sequential analysis and um, discussion of each thing, but rather be a bit more of a random walk about this and maybe jump you know, back to things you know, more than once during the hour. We'll just see how that goes. <clears throat> but I thought I would start out by giving you all my, current, my initial sense of the kind of the, the list of things that we ought to be covering. Um, and maybe this will be roughly the order in which we cover them, but we shall see, because obviously the idea here is to be as interactive as possible. Um, so, first of all, I think it's definitely worth having a little bit of a discussion about the changes, or perhaps the lack of changes, that are occurring with regard to the role of advocacy in our crusade. And, um, you know, the reason why there might be such changes is because of the rise of, um, especially the private sector, involvement in this um, crusade. And, you know, I mean, a simplistic <clears throat> way of thinking might be, well, OK, the private sector has got the message. Let them get on with it. Uh, you know, advocacy has done its job. I think that's definitely not. I think that's definitely oversimplistic, but I think it deserves little analysis. Um, then a lot of what I want to discuss today concerns advocacy to government, um, <clears throat> which is... Um, you know, uh, a large part of, of what we do, of course, and which has become more of a thing over the past couple of years, but especially since the elections in the US. Uh, of course, Dylan Livingston is going to be hosting his own hour to discuss some of that. Um, but, uh, you know, during this hour, we can certainly touch on that in perhaps a broader way. And, um, you know, I think I think there's definitely a lot to discuss there. Um, but the main thing I really want to cover, and there are lots of aspects of this, uh, is, the, is, is the essential way in which we may be able to leverage the pandemic um, to get more public support, and that means public support at every level. It means gen the support of the general public, it means support of governments around the world, uh, for our crusade, for longevity um, research, for rejuvenation, biotechnology, and all of that. And of course, the logic here is that COVID has predominantly affected the older generation, and it would have been a great deal less expensive, quite apart from causing a great deal less suffering and death, if the elderly did not have a weaker immune system than young adults. So. Uh, there's a lot to be talked about in regard to how we might be able, uh, we, humanity, might be able to mitigate the likelihood and or the severity of future pandemics by investing preemptively to a much greater extent in um, the longevity crusade. All right, so that's basically the kind of things I want to discuss. And of course, I've got, you know, a, a deeper, you know, narrower uh, you know, sub-verticals, as they say, uh, within that, that we should be getting into. But I do absolutely want to emphasise that this is not a talk. This is a discussion. This is, um, you know, very much like the things, as I mentioned earlier, that, that uh, Foresight have been organising on Gather over the past little while. 
And so I really want everybody to be unhesitating in getting stuck in, interrupting me, and not letting me run on and on. Um, <clears throat> all right. And there are now 37 people here, including me, so that's great. Um, so, um, well, okay. Does advocacy still matter very much? Um, I believe that the key points here that say, yes, it does, are firstly with regard to governments and then also with regard to uh, p people in the private sector who might oversimplistically be viewed as having already, you know, um, picked up the ball and run with it. Um, so first of all, governments. Um, I mean, there's one very, um, you know, s simple fact here, which is that governments have a lot of money. I mean, a lot of money. They can print it. And, um, you know, we always uh, are celebrating the rise of the private sector over the past five or so years on the principal basis that investors have, or at least spend, more money than donors do, by and large. So a lot of projects have been able to enjoy considerable acceleration as a result of being spun out from nonprofits like Sense Research Foundation into startup companies um, just because they then have access to the checkbooks of people who want to make money and not just make a difference. So that's all wonderful. But governments have more money than investors. So, you know, that has to be not ignored. And the more that we can persuade governments to spend that money, the better. Um, but even bigger than that, and this is huge, this is, I mean, this is, this is so little said, it's crazy. Governments make the rules, hello. You know, that's actually something that people forget a lot. And we've been reminded about it in the past week or so with the discussion around whether, you know, IP protection should be essentially lifted in relation to COVID vaccines in order to get the um, vaccines out there to the developing world faster. And of course, there's a big debate about that. Um, you know, I am absolutely not a politician and I am certainly not, you know, expert on any of the aspects of that debate in terms of its, um, you know, its, its sanity or otherwise. But I can see both sides, definitely. I can certainly see that this is very unlikely to be the, the last time that such a debate occurs. And in particular, that if there is, you know, the kind of turbulence that we can expect as a post-aging world becomes closer, we can definitely see the prospect of a good deal of discussion between, you know, governments and industry um, that may or may not go smoothly. And if it doesn't go smoothly, we can very much expect that governments will at least threaten to use the powers they have to override the principles that generally govern the private sector. You know, I, I have no idea where this is going, but I think it would be absolutely crazy to look at the things that were said over the past week or two about this and think that it's just one, a one-off. This is going to happen again. Now, I've noticed that a lot of people are obeying me in terms of getting stuck in, but they're doing so in the chat. So I'm going to have to read it. Um, uh, oh, good. I, this I can read it for you. Uh, so, oh, no, no. Well, it's okay. Yeah, go on, Chris. Yeah, so what I... we can do is just call on people. So this is supposed to be interactive. So I will ask Stephen Fox to unmute himself and ask his question in person. Yeah, one of the things that I've noted is that over the years, various researchers who are not that well funded by federal programs um, have talked about how nutrition impairments um, in the elders adversely affect their metabolic and um, uh, adaptive capacities. And to some extent, we can see this kind of issue going on with vitamin D deficiencies in elders where vitamin D supplementation, even though it's been small scale, has successfully and even dramatically reduced um, senior morbidity and mortality. Um, and this doesn't necessarily require a deep insight into aging mechanisms. It's just a simple patch to um, supplement vitamin D in elders. May I speak also to that? Please, Go jump in. To add in, okay. So not only am I you know, 200% on board with vitamin D and a whole bunch of other possible 
cheap and at worst harmless interventions. But it's not just the elderly, right? Almost everyone who got seriously sick and died of COVID is, is metabolically screwed up long before they get COVID, chronically for decades often. And those things too are in most cases easily rectified. You don't need nanotechnology and breakthroughs and trillions of dollars in funding to develop you know, new drugs. I mean, you just stop some terrible habits. But for some reason, our health authorities don't concentrate on that. They're like, stay home, be afraid, wait for a vaccine. You know, And it's like, they're giving the exact wrong information. And I think part of the problem, I don't mean to just complain, part of the problem is that there's just no money in these simple things like stop eating sugar, take vitamin D. No one's gonna make billions of dollars if everyone starts taking that advice, except possibly someone who has to pay for medical care who won't have to pay for it anymore. So anyway. Okay, next we have Victor. I want to defer to Aubrey to reply to that, but I have a reply to that if Aubrey doesn't worry. Yeah, I certainly well, do have a reply, but I'd like to hear what Carl says first, because obviously Carl's been right. quite active in the vitamin D and COVID world. So with respect to the, so I mean, I agree obviously with what both of you just said. I mean, you know, not just vitamin D, but a number of other ways people can shoot themselves in the foot or shoot their, you know, their immune health and other aspects of their health in the foot you know, have, have predisposed people to bad COVID outcomes. But with respect to the topic of the, you know, of the, the discussion, right, I believe the right way to frame this is the flip of what, of what Steve um, wrote, which is basically that, you know, the real point is that we all are aging. And when you shoot yourselves in the foot in various ways by being deficient in some important nutrient, which vitamin D deficiency is simply the most common by, by far, um, but or get too little sleep or, or don't exercise at all or et cetera. We, you know, we know all these different ways. What that is doing is essentially speeding up your aging. And we know that and we can trace that biochemically and we can tell the exact story about that. And you know, anti, you know, we don't, we should really correct those things as much as possible because those will slow the rate of aging or at least really stop accelerating the rate of aging because that's going to lead to a bunch of badness besides just COVID susceptibility. But that's the sort of way to talk about it as a speed up of aging. And in fact, I just posted to both Twitter and LinkedIn in the past week about how vitamin D deficiency speeds aging. And what we want are aging therapeutics, which will make up for any of these deficiencies, because we know we're not going to get everybody to sleep optimally and exercise optimally and all that kind of stuff. But even if they did, it would only slow their rate of aging compared to, you know, doing it all uh, right or you know, doing it wrong. So, you know, we still need what what we are all here to talk about advocating for. And if we spin the message that way, everybody will see it. Yeah. So, <clears throat> okay. So, uh, uh, yeah, I've got a bunch of comments um, relating to what all, all of you said. Um, so, first of all, uh, yeah, I'm, this is very much keeping to my word and jumping around pretty randomly over the topics. I had this topic at, like halfway down my list. Um, I believe that actually, rather than beginning with what Carl just said, namely the importance of the um, of essentially generalizing from uh, COVID to aging and observing that there's a lot in common between the things that work for, for both. I think the starting point, I mean, that's definitely something that needs to be in the conversation, but the starting point, I believe, needs to be the importance of public education generally. So, of course, we've got all of this great information uh, showing the benefits of vitamin D against COVID, even setting aside for a moment the more general benefits. But let's remember that early on in the pandemic, there was a lot of, well, I'm not going to say hysteria, but a lot of um, um, premature enthusiasm for things that ended up not um, going so far as um, vitamin D has done. And a large part of that is because of the immobility, the, 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 um, you know, the lack of empowerment of the public to make rapid decisions that are also reasonably reliable. In other words, to understand how to balance information. Now, obviously, this is a, you know, this this is a problem that has existed since the beginning of civilization, and you know, probably speech. Um, but it's a problem that applies to us every bit as much as it does to anybody else. We've got other sides of it, of course. So, um, 
few weeks ago, I gave the first in-person invited talk that I had given for more than a year. It was in Miami. And another of the speakers was Joe Mercola, who, uh, separately from his main theme of the, of the um, event, decided to get up and talk about, um, know, very, very passionately about his view that vaccines are bad for you. Um, and I had to, uh, you know, uh, challenge that with all of the passion that, as you know, I am able to bring to uh, such matters. Um, but yeah, I mean, you've got authoritative people, people who have a wide and trusting audience saying very dangerous things. And, um, you know, that can be at, at many levels. So, you know, my sense is that governments kind of understand that that problem exists, but they are as unable as the rest of us to implement some kind of blanket, really effective solution to it, because, you know, lack of education is a fact of life. Therefore, they are looking to people like us for ways to at least slightly mitigate the problem and slightly improve people's ability to evaluate information properly. If that can happen, you know, we could be getting somewhere. Now, the, um, yeah, the, the, basically, you know, the rest of what you guys said, I, I do obviously agree with, and I think I want to get on very much to the, um, the question of the uh, generalization from COVID susceptibility to aging in general. But I think that's a sufficiently distinct topic that perhaps we should continue on this one for a little while, especially since I see that Steve has just said, oh. Hang on. Uh, we have a long list of people waiting uh, here. I will, let, I will let Chris decide uh, the yeah. order. Uh, let's see. First, Victor, do you want to bring up your point or shall I move on? Victor, unmute yourself and tell us, do you want to make your point? Uh, no, I, I just wanted to ask if we can do that later or whatever. Uh, if Because uh, obviously, to what extent, uh, I mean, because obviously it's uh, a matter of being diseased in the first place as well and not only aiding of the immune system okay yeah i certainly want to talk about that later on um yeah okay let's let, let's show, let, let's park that one for a okay. few minutes. next up we have luke luke has his hand up hold on let me get 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 away from the section of the house with the babies and so <laughs> um, hi chris hi aubrey um hi. you know somebody I, I don't know whether it was aubrey but somebody early on mentioned that the problem we face, um, it, it, it might have been Creon, that the, there's no money in just getting vit vitamin D out to people. And um, there, well, there's so many different things that I could say about what we've learned about the, the incentives in our system um, and how they are messed up. But what I do want to say is that there are people who have figured out how to work within very, very broken systems and build giant businesses despite the bad incentives and that at gigafund that's our purpose is to find those people however rare they are you know even if it doesn't know 10 years which would be terrible because we'll be aging for 10 years to find the aging entrepreneur who figures out because i think that's this is part of the question by the way if and if, if you can't build a company that um or a system of some kind that um, actually profits from doing something as smart as giving vitamin D to everybody, well, then you're failing. If you're only doing things like there's some small molecule you have patent on and you're making tons of money or you have some kind of in with the administration to, to make tons of money, you will, I don't think you're going to create the right interventions. And the nugget I want to put in is that where we have started, and I want to hear ideas for other ones, is we believe the insurance industry is the, the place where you can still change things where this, the small interventions can make you money. Um, and we have funded that both at Founders Fund um, with Collective Health and Oscar um, and at Gigafund with Sauna Benefits where um, we are able to save 20% on people's health insurance uh, uh, bills for, for companies by make so, is some in part, mostly a lot of dumb stuff you guys probably don't want to hear about, but some in part by we're hoping to be able to make interventions like this. So if there are other if people can come up with that, maybe not on this call, but if someone does that, I'm all ears. If you figure out a way to solve that problem, that is what I'm interested in. That's what my, you know, my partner Steve is interested in. He's very, very interested in health uh, interventions. 
that can be scaled and the kinds of people who can build the companies that can scale them. Yeah, Luke, I think that's a wonderful point. I, I want to amplify it. Before I do so, though, um, you know, Luke doesn't appear on these things all that often. So some of you may not know who he is, um, but he um, was instrumental in the origins of PayPal, along with Peter Thiel and uh, Sean Parker and Ken Harry. And of course, um, you know, Peter has done an absolutely enormous amount in this field, not least by being the first major donor to my work. Uh, Sean Parker has done an amazing amount with his work in cancer immunotherapy and Luke too. So where the fuck is Ken? Why isn't he doing stuff? Um, uh, but anyway, um, yeah, Luke, so this is a wonderful point. I completely so agree. I so agree. Um, I mean, if we look at the TAME trial, which of course we're all familiar with, the trial of metformin, this is another drug that no one's going to make any money out of because it's been off patent since, you know, before we were born. Um, but insurance companies, totally, you know, if insurance companies knew that, you know, the, the extent to which metformin would benefit or cause mortality and health, then they would be able to adjust premiums and you know, define plans based on metformin intake. And therefore, it is in their financial, their purely vested financial interest to find that out. And Therefore, I would have said that it was a no brainer that insurance companies should have funded the TAME trial. But of course, we know that that didn't happen. It is, I gather, finally going to start this year, but it is going to be funded entirely by philanthropy. It's crazy. And next we have Ryan. Hey, so I want to piggyback off both these points. So I think that government plays a huge role in this because they actually, to, to Luke's point about insurance, I think one of the big changes in the market from um, kind of Obamacare is the drive for accountable care organizations and for these kind of complex systems to manage care and manage care organizations. And one of the challenges in the government, in the, in the structure of it, is that people switch, we have employer driven insurance and people switch employers every four years, every two years, every five years. So unless you're in the Medicare Advantage population where you truly have that managed care in the 65 and up, there's not that much incentive to do these studies. And then on top of it, I think there's both that systemic challenge, which has started to change because of the high deductible plans and the accountable care organizations. So there are opportunities there. But then there's the challenge of, um, uh, of also kind of our culture from when it comes to marketing, because the media, it's not so sexy to push out, oh, vitamin D, transformative, transformative. I think in America, there's also a different culture. And I think if you look at different countries, such as China, you see different you know, adoption patterns when it comes to wearing masks, when it comes to taking uh, medications, when it comes to anything that the government says to do. In Asian, in certain Asian countries, there are different adoption patterns. So I think government matters tremendously. And in the US, we face a lot of structural problems that really do impact it. Yeah, totally agree. Totally agree. I mean, I don't have any particular um, response, but I completely agree. Well, I see a question from Steve Fawkes asking, Steve, do you want to ask about your investment question? Sure. I was just going to ask the question, um, what would be the policy impact and the public health impact of forbidding public monies to be invested in proprietary technologies um, and to look at if there were a downside to that, and I know that there would be, how would that compare if that same amount of money were to be invested in generic technologies? Yeah, I, I think government money funds a lot of proprietary new things because you, you get that from NIH as you, you, you're funding a lot of new novel knowledge. So I don't know that that would, that would stymie science in my opinion. I don't know if anyone well, else wants to I, I know that it would. And the question is, though, that if you took that same amount of money and you put it into vitamin D and vitamin A and nutrition research and metabolic effects of, of, of interventions and things like that, what would be the effect on public health, not the private industry? Yeah, I mean, I see a lot of drugs That's that hard. come out, new drugs that come out with marginal efficacies, just slightly better than something that's generic. 
And if you look at the funding for that, you find a lot of public health money going into those kinds of developments. Whereas things like vitamin D, which have a massive potential that's maybe 10 or 100 or 1,000 times more capable of benefiting public health, get ignored. Any comments, Aubrey? How, how would we fix this? Do other countries do better? Now, that's a question. Do other countries uh, do I mean, better? I feel I, I feel that there is definitely no one right answer to the, well, the set of questions that have been raised in the past couple of minutes. Because, you know, let's face it, we look across the world, we see a very wide variety of different systems. Some of them have, you know, done some things better for the pandemic in terms of saving lives and, and minimizing spread. And some of them have done other things better. You know, I'm very reluctant to say who's right. Okay. Um, I would also is... suggest that it would be pretty easy to just to say, um, we don't know the full impact of the question I just asked and to say, let's for the time being, let's make it 50-50. Okay, well, let's move yeah. on. We have another question, Dan Elton. <clears throat> Hi, uh, it's not really a question, but um, I just wanted to say that I talked with Tom Khalil, who I'm sure a lot of you know, and he, he's been uh, advocating for more <clears throat> publicly funded uh, large scale trials on uh, generic drugs. And he said he believes it could be in the government's interest because of the Medicare and Medicaid services and obviously the budget difficulties with, um, you know, welfare programs like that. So um, I'm just really curious what's what's holding holding things back i mean what's the what's the uh what's the bottleneck here i mean because uh it well, seems would... pretty that argument seems pretty pretty good to me yeah, uh, why, would... why aren't we getting more rational like resource allocation into into these you know kind of pu pu with public funds especially now that you know pu public funding for nih is like at an all-time high i wonder whether the missing ingredient in the Conversation is the one that Luke brought up, namely the role of private insurance companies. You know, anything that can be um, can be discussed, as, uh, can be described as a public-private partnership, tends to have much more straightforward path to bipartisan support. Um, and so, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, Medicare and Medicaid they are insurance schemes, right? If there were some kind of cohesion and synergy created between private insurance and public insurance, perhaps nationally, perhaps globally, then maybe that would be a large step towards the um, thing you just described, Dan. Okay, next we have a hand by Steve Fox. And anyone who would like to speak, either raise your hand using the reaction button or put your comment in the chat and I will try to call on you. Yeah, um, I think that the answer to the question has to do with the culture in America that is, that is entrenched on academic levels, bureaucratic levels, um, um, the regulatory practices surrounding medicine, and that basically it all centers on the way in which money influences politics and that, that then influences into these institutions that are related to politics. Um, so that we're basically dealing with a disease management industry as the actor. And anything that we do to undermine disease, to undermine degenerative and, and chronic illness is going to adversely affect that bottom line. And that that then manifests through political pressure to keep that from emerging. Yeah, that was actually going to be, well, that is actually going to be my next topic after we've just heard from Creon and Carl. Um. Great, Creon. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, look, I am just so disappointed and appalled at how we blew this opportunity to, to do simple interventions and get people healthy using COVID. It's almost like COVID didn't matter. Like we could have just used it as, as a lever to get people healthy and it would have made such a big difference in the long run that COVID might have not even been noticeable in the big picture, but it would have, but we didn't. And that, you know, I can just endlessly get depressed about that. However, I think there's an upside, basically, 
kind of, which is that it's never too late. Like the neat thing about a lot of these interventions, a lot of these cheap, you know, harmless at worst and possibly very beneficial interventions that can improve everyone's health, you know, you know, kind of COVID is just a sideshow in there, that like it's never too late. Like that train is still waiting at the station for us to get on board and we can board it whenever we get our act together. So, I mean, the longer we wait, the more people who are sick are going to get sicker and die, but, but we can always do it. And so that's, that's something to keep in mind when we're talking about how to possibly make it happen. Next up, we have Carl. So this is going to lead into what I think you were saying was your next topic, Aubrey. So just I want to point out that it's not just in terms of the the lifestyle type things and their effect on health. It's not just that there's not money in them. Lots of people think that there's active suppression from the entrenched pharmaceutical companies for whom there would be a lot of profit loss. So, for example, if you if you took every clinical trial for every drug and pharmaceutical and you made all the controls and the treatment arms both remedy all deficiencies, sleep enough, um, you know, get enough exercise and eat a good diet, you would see reduced efficacies across the board probably because probably large fraction of pharmaceutical efficacy is due to making up for, you know, various ways that people shoot their health in the foot. Um, so now it's, there's lots of, conspiracy theories about just how active the, the suppression is for various easy things like vitamin D, and there's not a lot of smoking guns. Um, but what I think the lesson, you know, I don't know, I want to debate about that, but the important topic with respect to aging advocacy is that, you know, the kinds of interventions that we want to develop pharmacologically or based on, you know, next generation interventions like cell therapies and gene therapies, you know, to fight aging are going to be massively more effective than simply correcting vitamin deficiencies. Um, and that is something that will require big money to do and also, you know, just to, to research. And the, what we really want to have happen is the pharmaceutical companies to get fully behind that competing with each other because whoever gets there first will make massive amounts of money. And what we really don't want to have happen is the pharmaceutical companies to decide to fight against this because it's it's interrupting cash cows. And I think that's an important um, thing that we need to make sure we avoid having happen. And I just as a side comment, I also just want to say it's, you know, we're past halfway through the hour and I'm sure Aubrey has a lot of other things, topics to, to discuss um, with respect to COVID-19 and leveraging it. Yeah, so let me actually, even though there are a couple of questions in the queue, let me just dive in a little bit, um, essentially leveraging what Carl just said and what um, I was saying earlier. I think here the point is that a lot of people tend to see certain um, conflicts of vested interest of different communities as more immutable than they actually are. In other words, they tend to be um, you know, too short-sighted in identifying the existence of best of both world scenarios. So the biggest one that comes up all the time is the idea that the medical industry, especially big pharma, ultimately has a business model where it makes its money out of keeping sick people alive in a sick state and spending a lot of money on their treatment. And therefore, the pharmaceutical industry is actively opposed to preventative medicines in general that keep people healthy. Um, so, you know, to some extent, at the moment, it looks like that's true. But even at the moment, it's only to some extent. There are massive exceptions to this. The two that always come up, and I think correctly so, are ACE inhibitors for high blood pressure and statins for high cholesterol, which, of course, started out being used really as treatments, but which rather rapidly edged their way into being predominantly preventative simply because they could. Now, when I say they could, I don't just mean scientifically it works. I mean the message that it works got through to the ultimate people who spend the money, namely the general public. So I think that one thing that is not nearly emphasized enough is the um, 
the, the, the feedback loop, so to speak, between education of the public, public policy, uh, opinion forming in general, you know, the impact of the Oprah Winfrey's of this world, and the private sector. Yes, these people have different, very different ultimate interests and motives and vested, vested interests and so on. But those motives are not irretrievably contradictory to each other. We just need to be a bit more articulate, I think, in communicating the ways in which they can all be satisfied and everyone wins. And, you know, I, I, think, I think that's something, something we can discuss generally, but of course also in the context, context of COVID. So really what I wanted to do is to, um, you know, to perhaps um, move the discussion along into the relationship between the pandemic and the um, and aging in general um, you know, uh, various people, Victor, have um, already raised this. I think that we need to look at this from a biological perspective, a biomedical perspective, obviously, but also from a political perspective at the same time. And we can't like do one for we can't do those things sequentially. Um, so, of course, we all know from a biomedical perspective that COVID is ridiculously more dangerous for the elderly and for people who have, you know, um, perhaps unusually early onset age-related conditions. Um, but we also know that every infection, pretty much, has at least some bias in favour of being more dangerous to the elderly. And, um, you know, that's bad enough. So I, I've been saying for a while that we really have one train that is probably not going to wait at the station for very much longer, namely the... Uh, question of how policymakers around the world, or let's talk about mainly the US if you like, um, are going to act when they shift their attention, or at least the centre of gravity of their attention, away from the current pandemic and towards preempting and minimising the likelihood and or the severity of the next pandemic and the one after that. That's going to be happening right now in the corridors of power. And it is, I mean, there is nothing more important than being a voice at that table that tells people that the way to do this comes under many, you know, many forms. There are many ways to contribute to that, you know, putting more money into infrastructure and putting more money into, um, you know, regulatory reform and global cooperation and so on. But at the end of the day, the single thing that is by far going to make the most difference is even a rather modest postponement of the, those underlying health problems of late life that predispose the elderly to severe symptoms from infections that young adults simply don't um, suffer very badly from. It's, you know, it's the big thing. So I think the real focus I want to have for at least a few minutes in this discussion is the way in which that can be done more effectively than it has been done in the past. And in order to uh, introduce that, I want to remind everybody of the way it has been done in the past, or one particular example of it anyway. Many of you will be familiar with the initiative started mm, at least 15 years ago, probably longer, uh, by a number of very eminent and well-respected <laughs> people in the field. It, it went under the heading the Longevity Dividend. And it made a completely irrefutable case that a really modest postponement of the health problems of late life would have the most utterly astronomical economic benefits. You know, the numbers were actually calculated on the basis of very conservative assumptions, and still they came out completely insane. And the impact of that initiative on public policy was pretty much exactly zero. So we have to ask why. Now, to me, it's bleeding obvious why. The simple answer was that the science was not far enough along, was not mature enough for scientists to be willing to stick their necks out and say, we can achieve X amount of postponement of longevity with X amount of extra amount of money in X amount of years with X probability. If you don't make a statement that has all four of those numbers in it, then you're not making any statement at all. And politicians, which were the audience, are not dumb enough not to notice that. So 
That, to my mind, is the entire reason why the longevity dividend completely failed to impact public policy. And now we are in a position where the science is much stronger, much more mature, and the <coughs> economic benefit argument is not merely being made in print by a bunch of august academics, it's being made in the figures that politicians read in the papers every single day with the, with the COVID, uh, COVID pandemic. So I believe that now is the time to, you know, to revisit and rejuvenate the longevity dividend initiative with the much greater degree of evidence behind it that we have now relative to what we had in the past. And that comes back, of course, very strongly to what Victor and others have already raised, namely that this is not just about immune senescence. Immune senescence is, is part of aging, it's a really big part, but every part of senescence talks to every other part. So we've got, of course, really great conspicuous results in early stage clinical trials like the TRIM trial that I'm sure you all know about. Uh, in terms of immune rejuvenation, but the rest of rejuvenation is just as... Well, we lost oh, has Aubrey frozen for everyone? Yes. Okay, yeah. well, <laughs> while we're waiting for Aubrey to unfreeze, how... Uh, Aubrey, you froze for a second. Are you about done or should... or you want to wrap up? That was... I was in the middle of my last sentence. Actually. Try again. See if you okay. can do the last sentence again. Repeat your last sentence, yes. Uh, tell me what you last heard, and I will... Um... Oh, no testing. You don't get to test us. <laughs> just wing it, Aubrey. Try to do something. Yeah. yeah, no, I was just saying, you know, if we can get the message across that immune senescence is the low-hanging fruit, the thing where the focus of the biggest potential bang for the buck when it comes to adapting public policy to preempt the severity and likelihood of the next pandemic, then we have a chance to go the necessary next step and get people to understand and act upon the fact that the whole of senescence needs to be addressed in the same way in order to get the maximum amount of immune rejuvenation. Okay, and on that note, Keith Comito, you have been saying you can comment. Yeah, so I just want to piggyback on what Aubrey was saying about the longevity dividend and then translate that into some of what's happening now. So I second everything that was said. One way I like to phrase it is uh, in that original paper, it had these you know wonderful astronomical um, numbers on the benefits that will occur if we remediate aging, but no discussion of what the probabilities of actually achieving that goal is. So any politician at the time is reading it as zero times wonderful equals zero, so I'm out, right? So I, I think that's that's a message that we can be uh, better on. Also, obviously, at the time, they didn't know any, they didn't really take into account the financial benefits of mitigating pandemics, which are also huge, which is something we can now uh, bring to the conversation. Uh, but what I would say is even now, there, there's kind of um, papers that are coming out that are, that are picking up that same mantle of the longevity dividend but still, in my opinion, not in a publicly accessible way. You know, it's like these obtuse, you know, economic metrics and things like that. When we really need to position this in terms that people already are expressing that they care about, like uh, how this will help me start my life a few years sooner if I'm a young person, because I don't, you know, I have less time than I'm going to need to to spend all my time taking care of my ailing family members. What does this mean in terms of? healthcare costs to healthcare outcomes. People are already sensitive to that. We need to translate these conversations into those hot button topics because there are already um, vibrant discussions on that. Um, and one, th one also point here is that we're talking about now about how we ourselves can you know, get in the doors of power and try to let you know, leverage whatever levers we can to, to affect change, which we absolutely do. But I think what always gets left out is the value of creating decentralized and numerous soldiers for our cause by savvy PR initiatives. So some of you might remember the, the video that uh, Lifespan.io helped to do with Kors Kazakh a few years ago, a YouTube channel. And that series hit like 13 million people. And I still think it's, it's brought the most people to our community. People still mention it to me every day. And I think if we, these things cost budget, but if we could put together enough money to get some of those videos to come out made by channels like Kors Kazakh that basically make this case in a very savvy way to the public, you know, and that can incorporate things like vitamin D and, you know, you know, go out and take it. And if that goes out to 
20 million people in a country and they start taking vitamin D in, in the current scenario, that would move the needle a little bit uh, on the current pandemic. So I think we shouldn't be so obsessed with trying to do the job only ourselves. We should try to see how are there ways we can give the torch to people who are already carrying similar torches. Aubrey, did you have a tweak to make about the wording on that? Um, not on the wording on that. I was replying to Carl's comment. Um, so Carl made an interesting point in the chat um, about the um, um, the fact that even though COVID has cost a lot of lives, aging costs a lot more. And of course, that's very true. And it highlights the importance of um, uh, of doing something about aging. But I kind of think it gives people the opportunity to run away from the question, which obviously we know that everybody is so keen to do um, by essentially, you know, uh, selectively interpreting it as, oh, COVID is an alternative to aging. Um, you know, aging, uh, COVID is something we can treat, aging is something we can't treat. Therefore, you know, you're not making a point. I think we have to kind of do it differently in a manner that inextricably binds COVID and aging together in a manner that says like, you know, if we could fix aging, then not only would we fix COVID as a side benefit, we would also fix a whole bunch of other things. You know, we have to be careful with the wording there. I think that's what I'm saying. Okay, Stephen Fox has been waiting. Do you have a comment, Steve? Yeah, I actually have two, but the one that I think that is most relevant is this issue of, of perceived risk versus actual risk. When you look at uh, mortality rates and you look at, uh, at COVID, you know, the original projections were 3% by the CDC and 3.4% by the WHO. And that made COVID so immensely more dangerous than the flu that that justified a panic reaction. But when we realized, scientifically at least, that for every person in the hospital that was dying, there was 10 to 20 people out in the general public that had COVID and it was minor and they sailed right through it or maybe it was bad enough that they you know, were sick for days like they had the flu, but they didn't consider it um, you know, sufficient to get to the hospital that um, the difference between 0.2% mortality from the flu and 0.2% mortality from COVID is fairly trivial. Even if you say 0.3%, um, the, the, that difference in, in death rate is relatively minor compared to the psychological perception of COVID as being 10 times worse than anything we've ever experienced before since maybe the Spanish flu or something like that, which is just not the case. And that if we do implement a program of anti-aging, all we're gonna do is postpone those deaths and we give them vitamin D. Okay, people aren't gonna die at 80, they're gonna die at 90 or they're gonna die at 100. So what will happen is that, you know, if this program would be implemented, the death rate, the annual death rate would drop from viral diseases from 0.2 to 0.1, and then it would slowly creep back up again to 0.2, and it would all be, again, presumed to be part of a natural process. Yeah, Steve, I just want to um, agree with that and, and amplify it in, one, in two small ways. First of all, I mean, I think it's very important. Uh, and people are talking about this occasionally, but it doesn't seem to be a particularly prominent topic of conversation that seasonal flu has just been wiped out by the social distancing phenomenon. You know, we saw this in the Southern Hemisphere, of course, first. And, you know, the Southern Hemisphere is that far off place of which we know little. And so people didn't really pay attention. But just a few people have been doing the statistics, which is now possible, of course, on the Northern Hemisphere. And it's just the same. So, you know, um, you know, the reason why the excess death numbers from all causes uh, are so, are so you know, modest um, uh, is, of course, substantially because of that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I really agree with everything um, with what you said about we've got to think about these things properly. And if people are still in the mindset of, oh, we're just going to be having people get sick at a later date, then, um, you know, still, we've got an argument, we can say, well, okay, yeah. but they stay healthy for longer. We but call it aging. <clears throat> but of course, uh, what we'd like to do is to get people to understand long Gravity escape velocity, in which case we're in a very different situation. Yeah, and also the the whole issue of of flu deaths from masking and from social distancing and stuff like that was further compounded by the fact that a lot of flu deaths were blamed on COVID. That really um, wasn't the case. Yeah, probably. 
Okay, like, next up is Creon, and then we may need to go to Aubrey for uh, see if he has things to say in his wrap up. Well, Creon has disappeared. Hang on, I, how about now? There you go, I, I see you. Right. So um, yeah, sorry to bring all this stuff up. I kind of feel like if I can't talk to it with you all, then who can I talk to, to talk about it with? Okay, a couple things that were just said. First of all, flu versus COVID. Uh, Steve, you're absolutely right as far as I know, but it's, it's actually flu's worse because flu kills children. If you're talking about like quality life years lost, flu is actually worse than COVID. And you know, nobody can say that without being banned on social media and stuff like this. It's really pathetic. Um, or censored. Yeah, yeah, right. The idea that, that social distancing and masking somehow clobbered flu, but allowed COVID to run rampant, that seems like a really dubious proposition to me. It's just as likely in my mind that those people who were, you know, like there was a displacement, viruses compete with each other or something like that. It can't just be as simple as all the stuff that didn't work to contain COVID somehow managed to contain flu. That's, that seems arguably wrong to me. Another thing is, this is all wrapped up together. The CDC, very early on, when they were promoting these high estimates of uh, fatality rates, they confounded case fatality rate, which is how many people who come into the hospital with the disease die, with infection fatality rate, which is how many people whose cells actually get uh, start reproducing the virus, but maybe get no symptoms, die. They confounded it. They issued a report which swapped those two numbers. They put a 10 times higher estimate because of this and they never retracted the error it was an elementary error that the people at the helm of those organizations it's inexcusable that they made it and it's doubly inexcusable that they never retracted it and said that they were wrong they think that by never saying they're wrong they increase their credibility they've actually tanked their credibility and this is a kind of the elephant in the room that we have to talk about is that these authorities have now lost their authority and rightly so and what are we going to do about that Another last thing is that the similar thing happened with the zero prevalence studies and the herd immunity and the, the IFR estimates. The people who did zero prevalence studies early on, they were attacked by the authorities in an ad hominem way. And it was only because of the, they had tenure and they had reputations and they had spine and backbone that they were able to stand up to this. That's just unconscionable what was done with that kind of stuff. It was as if the authorities were deliberately trying to make this thing sound way worse than it was and you know this is like chicken little this is not going to be in their long-term best interest to do this and frankly when the next pandemic comes around if it really is the zombie apocalypse people are not going to believe it because they were lied to last time so i don't know I don't know what to do, but I want to know what we might do about this because, for instance, I've been asked to be on a couple of committees, strangely enough, which are government committees as well as a private important committee that are looking at kind of a retrospective lessons learned from this pandemic. And they're really quite open to some of these semi contrarian ideas. And I want to know, like, if anyone has suggestions for how to bring this stuff up without just sounding like a a madman or alienating people. I just feel like it's got to be dealt with. But then again, I don't want to just like be the crazy person. Aubrey, we have four minutes before 11. How do you want to spend them? Sure. OK, yeah. So um, I think, you know, rather than spending too much time wrapping up per se, I want to kind of try and focus us on calls to action. You know, that's always a good way to end things. Um, First of all, I really want to say how inspired I am by the idea that came up as a result of the conversation, I think really initiated by Luke, about the role of insurance. And in particular, you know, I think my, the, the take on it that I am particularly excited by is the possibility of a real conversation and convergence and synergy between public insurance and private insurance for health and for life for that matter, um, but especially health, because, you know, that's where the money gets spent from the public side. Um, you know, this is something that as far as I know, just doesn't happen. And it's fucked up. It's crazy. You know, I believe that there must be some extent to which some of us here can deal with this. We have the number one cryonics insurer with us today. I happen to have just noticed his face. Um, but uh, there are probably other people here who know a bit about insurance and who have connections with people who have decision making um, power within that community. So this could be something that 
we could ramp up really heavily. Um, other than that, the other point that I think I want to make in the last minute or two is with regard to the speed with which people change their minds and change their positions on things, which is glacial, as we all know. Um, and this really matters here. I mean, I, I've, I've been um, celebrating quite a lot over the past few years the fact that more and more of the really young generation, people in their 20s, are coming into this field. And the reason I feel that those people, whom I like to call the children of the revolution, are so important is because they never needed to change their position, to change their minds. They were never brought up to be you know, being brainwashed into the idea that ageing is some kind of you know, blessing in disguise or that it's some kind of immutable, natural, universal thing that is off limits to medicine. You know, Vitalik Buterin read my book when he was 14. And you know, that, that's what we're seeing more and more right now. But generalising from that, what we can say is that people who are our age can also be educated, it just it takes time. And they have, you know, um, vested interests like they don't want their spouses to divorce them, um, you know, because they might prohibit them. And I, I know of at least two actual, actual certain cases of people who would have given Sense Research Foundation a lot of money if their wives had let them. So, um, you know, this is something that we have to treat not just with individuals in isolation, there are a number of cases of people who have been interested in principle in this field for a very long time and who are only now finding the, well, let's call it the courage, to, uh, they wouldn't like to use that word, of course, um, to actually put their heads over the parapet and get properly involved. And we don't have nearly enough of that yet. The more we can get, the better. And I've got 23 seconds left, so I will uh, leave it to Chris. And in those 23 seconds, I will officially offer to take the spouses on a retreat led by me, which only spouses will come on, and we will then schmooze and bond over the topic of how do we make the world a healthier place for our children, which it turns out includes longevity. So whatever, okay, let's fix that spouse problem. Is every married person here a spouse? Okay, so I'm not sure. So, um, all right. On that note, it is now at on Pacific time. It is. Thank you so much, Aubrey. That was fabulous.